but we do have a special guest this morning, and so I would like to introduce now uh, Pastor Chuck Carroll, and uh, and if you would come and just bring an awesome word this morning, uh, trust him first. Let's give it up for Pastor Chuck this morning. Not sure what that's what's going on there, but. God bless you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God is good, amen. Good morning, Charleston First. Praise the Lord. How many are thirsty for God this morning? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love your praise and worship. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What we were singing this morning is so true. God will never let you down. And certainly his love is fierce. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's an honor and a privilege this morning to be here with you at Charleston First. And uh, we're thankful that Pastor Charles would call on us to uh, fill his pulpit. We're humbled at the same time that we're honored to be here with you today. And we trust that God is going to do what God, only God can do. Amen. Uh, after you listen to me speak for a few moments, you'll realize that I don't come to you with fancy words. And if I do use one, I may or may not know the meaning of it. <laughs> but I tell you this, I serve a God, and the Holy Spirit of God is in me, who is the real preacher. And when Pastor Charles called me, I sought God long and hard about what to bring this morning, what to speak on. And I'm the type of minister that if God would have changed my mind right up until the moment that Pastor Otis would have called me up here, I would have gone in a different direction. So far, he hasn't done that. The word I have this morning may not be a tickling word or an easy word, but it's a word that I believe that we as believers need to hear. And if none of you need it, then perhaps I need to hear it one more time, okay? So try to keep in mind that if this is not for you, just let it kind of go over your head, amen? But it'll encourage me if you'll shout and praise him anyway. Praise God. Amen? Come on now, we're going to have fun. Amen? I'm so thankful that uh, my lovely wife, Jan, came with me. And I was surprised that my daughter, Michelle, came also. Uh, Jan, would you stand and greet the people, please? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that. If you have your Bibles, your iPads, your tablets, your smartphones, whatever you got, 
if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to talk to you this morning. I want to minister. I want to bring a word to you this morning. Trusting in the Lord God. Trusting in the Lord God. Hallelujah. We were singing about the hurricane. Hallelujah. That was a spiritual hurricane, but don't you know sometimes we get a physical hurricane coming our way? And sometimes we just have to trust God, don't we? We can batten down the hatches. We can board up the windows. And still, we have to trust God. We live in perilous times. I said we live in perilous times. And if, if the times aren't perilous enough for you, I believe according to what I read in Revelations, they are going to get worse. I believe it's time for us, the body of Christ, to begin to trust God like we never have trusted God before. I believe it's time we begin to plug our cords, spiritual cords, into his recept and get a direct current from God. Come on now. Hallelujah. God wants to give us something that the world can't take from us. God wants to give us something that our enemy, our only enemy, Satan, can't take from us. God wants to give us a word. God wants to give us an energy. God wants to give us a fire that can't be quenched. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, I ask that you would do through your servant what no other can do. I yield myself to your Holy Spirit, and we pray that, Lord, the results will be that which you desired in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36 read like this. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Access the promise. Amen? God is ready for you to receive. I want to talk to you for a moment about possessing the land. The children of Israel were marching. They had to do another 40 years lapse out in the desert because of doubt. If we're not careful, we're going to lose our promise. If we're not careful, we're going to lose our answer if we doubt. Sometimes in the face of of our circumstances, the face of negativity, the face of, of all hell coming against us, we have to dare to believe God for the answer we've asked for. Amen? We have to be so bold and so audacious that nothing can stop us from believing in God's power to answer prayer. Amen. I am reminded of a person that was in Jericho as Israel approaches Jericho. I don't know how long it took them to set up camp. The Bible doesn't tell us for sure how long they were there before they started that first day of marching, but we do know according to Scripture they marched for seven days, and on the seventh day, they marched seven times around Jericho, and Jericho back in those days was not a small city. Heavily fortified. It looked like it was an impossible, an impossible, conquerable city. And yet, God gave them a promise that they were going to succeed. God gave them a promise that they would, in fact, 
see Jericho fall. But there was a person in Jericho that God had a plan for. There was a person in Jericho that God was going to graft into the genealogy and the lineage of the Israelite families. And this was not a princess. This was not one of the renowned citizens of Jericho. Come on now. This was Rahab the harlot. But as she listened to the stories and the fables and the rumors talked around Jericho about this nation called Israel, something happened inside of her. Hope sprung up inside of her, and hope turned into trust. And her trust was in Jehovah, God of Israel. And don't you know that God gave her an opportunity to spare the spies that came into Jericho? And as she cooperated with the Spirit of God and the uh, men of God to spare their life and let them down on the outside wall of Jericho, I want you to know a promise was given to her. Now, this was a woman. This was a woman that by most of our judgments would not have deserved a promise from God. I want you to know that when God starts divvying out promises, he is not partial to who he divvies out promises to. I want you to know that what God says in his word, in the epistles, he desires that none should perish. God means what he says. It's time for us, the body of Christ, the, 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 the body of Jesus Christ to dare to believe God that he can save anyone, redeem anyone, deliver anyone, and that we would start praying for people that we know need to be saved, need to be delivered, need to be changed. God spoke something in my spirit not long ago, a week or two ago, might have been a little longer and God has been dealing with me about the direction that America is headed into. And, and, and I was praying about the election that's coming up. And God says, stop worrying about the election. Begin to pray for the candidates. Can I tell you something? If we say we believe in prayer and the power of prayer, why don't we, the body of Christ, regardless of what banner hangs over our church, no matter what fellowship or denomination we belong to, it's time that the church of Jesus Christ begins to unite in prayer for a common cause to see the power of God fall in America once again. I want you to know that if all the candidates were born again believers, full of the Spirit of God, what would difference would it make who got in? If you'll read Romans chapter 13, and I forget which verse, God clearly tells us in that book and in that chapter that He alone sets up those that are in authority. I have, been, I have been convinced from an early age that even though I'm responsible enough to go and exercise my liberty and rights as an American to vote, that God alone is responsible for who our president is. I don't have to moan. I don't have to murmur. I don't have to complain against my president regardless of who he was in the past because God set him up. Oh, some would say, well, so many Americans didn't go vote. That's the reason so-and-so got in that year. This, th this thing and this party and this group and special interest group was responsible for this president getting in. I want you to know if we really believe the word of God, if we stand that this isn't the inspired word of God, 
then we must stand on all of it. And that means that we believe what God says in Romans chapter 13, that he alone allows the person that governs us locally and federally. God is able. It's time we begin to dare to believe God that the worst of the worst, even if it were a harlot, could be saved. Filled with his spirit, doing his bidding, doing his will. And if God could save Rahab, if God could bring her into the nation of Israel and make her part of the genealogy and the lineage of that awesome nation coming up all the way through King David and, and into the birth of Jesus Christ, can he not do some great things to us? I don't know where you come from this morning, but God has a ministry for you. God has a calling on your life. God can do some great things in and through you if you would dare to believe him to remove all obstacles. You see, it doesn't matter if we have a platform. I very seldom get to stand and preach anymore, but I realize that God has a place for me. God has a ministry for me. And regardless of when and where it is, it's effective. God can do what I can't do. And sometimes we don't realize that a little bit here and a little bit there is much with God. Come on now. Wherever you work, God may be using you in a very powerful way if you'll dare to believe him to do so. Can you say amen? Amen. <clears throat> So if you've read the word, you've, you realize that Je Rahab was spared, her family was spared, and they moved on with Israel and became part of that awesome nation. Then over in Hebrews chapter 11, <coughs> pardon me, verses, verse 6 in Hebrews chapter 11 says, but without Faith is it, it is impossible to please God. God is challenging his people to dare to believe him, dare to stand on his word, to be bold and stand. God doesn't need us changing people. You know, you and I, I don't know about you, but I can't change anybody. You know how we are as husbands and wives. I met my wife, and we got married, and we started sharing a household. And I come to find out she squeezes the toothpaste from the middle, and sometimes right at the very beginning of the tube where it comes out. And see, I was raised very disciplined. Dad was military. Raised very disciplined. You squeeze that tube from the bottom and work your way up. I mentioned it to my beautiful wife a few times. She wasn't having it. I stopped paying attention because I don't know where she squeezed it at today. I think we got separate tubes. I'm, I was raised by somebody that was a survivor of the Great Depression. If you know anybody that was from that era, uh, uh, they're all about saving a penny. Hello? You don't have to save a penny when you trust God. But having said that, it kind of just got ingrained in me. So now I have one of them little toothpaste things that gravity does the squeezing for me. I stand it up, upside down, and it all flows to the spout. And I don't have to worry when it runs out, I have gotten every last drop out of that toothpaste container. So 
miracle. Gravity does its job. Amen? God's good. Praise God. Thank God for innovation. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God wants us to believe that he can move in any situation. I marvel at what I see God doing in our great land. I marvel because I see Christian men and women standing up and saying, God's in control. We're going to pray. We're going to pray about this situation. We're going to pray about this situation. We're going to be unified in prayer. Amen? Can I tell you, God has this election in control? Somebody told me, he says, well, what if we go into martial law? The, the new law says if we go into martial law, there won't even be an election. God has control over that too. If there's not an election, then God's in control of that. Amen? Somebody himself said, well, what if our money system fails? Wow, that, now I, had to, I had to think on that one a minute because <laughs> we're all about the money, aren't we? <laughs> what if we don't have enough, Brother Chuck? <laughs> then we'll have to get to a place like some of the old saints did that we believe God to put food on the table. We believe God to pay the bills. Amen? You see, sometimes we forget what God tried to get the children of Israel to learn early, early, early as a nation. That when God does something spectacular in your life yesterday, set up a spiritual memorial as a reminder so that on days when the money system in America should fail, you've got a reminder that the same God that delivered you from the Red Sea can deliver you if there's no money. Now, we're getting back to the basics, basics this morning. We believe it or we don't believe it. Cover to cover or do we just pick the parts we like? You see, if we pick the parts we're like, we're kind of like that child that won't eat anything you put on the table. Papa, I want a granola bar. Well, a granola bar is not meant to be your meal every day. Come on now. Sometimes you need something besides uh, mashed potatoes and gravy. Amen. Growing up, if I could have had ice cream at every meal, that would have been fine with me. But because my parents insisted that I eat other stuff, I grew up to have a pretty balanced palate. Hebrews 7 through 11 says, By faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Remember that now. Not yet ever seen having been seen before. Let me remind you, it had never rained on the earth before, and God comes talking to Noah about something called rain. The earth was watered by mist and steam from upwards of the earth rather than down from the sky. Here God comes talking to Noah about something called rain. I'm sure Noah's first response, what's this thing you call in rain? Just because we haven't seen it before doesn't mean God can't do it. Just because God's never showed us in his word or showed us in his service that he's done it that way doesn't mean God can't do it. Amen? Amen? Just because I don't have the experience that God's done it that way before doesn't mean he can't do it that way for you. Amen? Don't let people that's never seen it, done it, felt it, cheat you out of believing 
what God can do. Amen? God put something in your spirit. We need to hold tight to that. Amen? Hallelujah. Don't let your promises be stolen. By faith, verse 8, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of a place. It's hard leaving comfort zones. Amen? It's hard leaving what you call home to go someplace that God may lead you to, a strange land. Let me let that sink in for a minute. What if God called you to be a missionary and you're 88 years old? God can provide a way. Amen? I want to tell you something. You're never too old for God to work miracles in your life. You're never too old for God to do a spectacular thing in your life. You're not of the wrong gender, and you're not too young for God to do a spectacular thing. I believe everything God says in the book of Acts about our young people, that in the last days they're going to see visions, they're going to prophesy, and they're going to be awesome. Can you say amen? amen. But saints of God, as adults, we've got to start setting a better example for them. Sometimes I have to allow the Spirit of God to chastise me when I get to complaining. Oh, did I just say that? Did I complain? Yeah, I do sometimes. I complain. Sometimes I talk about being miserable. God, I want out. <laughs> and God just kind of shakes his head and doesn't respond because he's got me where he wants me. When you're going through a season, I don't care how dry it is, how messed up it is, if you're going to let God, you know something, saints, when we pray, God, your will be done, I'll go where you want me to go, I'll be what you want me to be. When you pray that prayer, God listens to that prayer, and he forgets those prayers you pray, God, get me out of this, because he remembers that prayer you prayed, I'll go. Where you want me to go, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. And that's the prayer he answered. Because you're going through a season that you may not understand it. You may not like it. You may not like how it feels. Whew. Wow, that chuck you're on my toes. Moving on. Hallelujah. Seeing the promise as done. I want to talk, to talk to you about that for a minute. Seeing the promise is done. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, it says to us, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, which are seen, we're not made of things which are visible. God wants us to understand that from nothing, God can make something. Go, going back to Genesis, he created this whole earth that we live on out of nothing. He spoke it into existence. He spoke our atmosphere, our firmament, our stars, our moon, our sun into existence. I'm going to give you some scriptures if you want to read them. 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through 16. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 through 40. Many of these journeyed. Many of these were faithful to God towards a promise, moving towards a promise, moving towards a promise. Never having received the promise, they saw God as having given it. They journeyed as though they had already received it by faith. God wants us to begin to believe him for miracles, for healings, for salvations, whether we see it or not. He wants us to journey as though it's already done. When we do that, then our faith is going to be bold and audacious. 
people aren't going to believe who you've become because the fire in you is unquenchable. The boldness in you is impossible to dent or do away with because it's not based on you, it's based on God's word. Amen. The veil of righteousness and traditions of men, men has already been rent and ripped. The truth has been opened for the hungry at heart, but fear has trapped many in disbelief and not able to advance in the powerful love of God. God wants to get us moving. God wants to shake us loose from doubt and fear. Amen? God wants to put us on a collision course with eternity that we would, hallelujah. How many believe we're just going to go to heaven and sit there and stand there and praise him forever and ever and ever and ever? Praise is going to be a big part of heaven. But I have this, I have this unction in my spirit. I have this mm, deep down inside of me that heaven is going to be an adventure that God's going to use us all over the place. How many galaxies are there? How many galaxies are there? There's more than I know about. Now imagine this, God using us over all of them as his children. God didn't do all this. This whole training ground of our life here was not so that we could just go sit down up there by a creek up in heaven and pat animals. We'll get to do that. But you and I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm fired up so that when I get to heaven, I'm fired up already. I'm not wanting the Lord Jesus to have to get me fired up after I've been judged faithful. Hello? I want to get there fired up. I want to get there ready. My imagination exploding for God. Believing that God could take me anywhere. Now, I know this is, not, this is extra biblical, so I'm making a disclaimer right now. This is extra biblical. This is not in the Word. But a what if, as a child of God, not the Son of God, but as one of His sons or daughters, he asked us to go be a savior somewhere else in another dimension. Would you be ready to be born only to be crucified? What if? See, God wants to prepare us for the what ifs now so that we're ready for the what ifs of eternity. What if God wanted you to be a prophet in eternity? What if God wants you to be this or they be something else? Are you ready now to start saying yes to God? God wants to know if we can say yes even in misery to his will. God wants to know if you can say yes to God. Wow. Mm, 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 mm. You see, here we're going on to our next point, becoming the warrior God called us to be. Go with me for just a moment over to 2 Samuel in chapter 23. Wow, when, when God showed me this in his word, I thought, wow, this, this trumps some of these movies that's coming out. Expendables 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You know how the sequences go. They just keep coming. I'm, I'm reminded of that movie, The 300. Anybody watch that one? Huh? And I see in all these, you know, made for TV, made for the movies, and I said, how can the guy, how can these guys, uh, 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 Jet Li, how can he whoop all them people? He knocked out like 25 guys at one time. How can he, oh, that's right, it's TV, it's movie. And then God showed me here something in 2 Samuel, verse 8. Verse 8, wow. 
a guy that I can't even pronounce his name, killed 800 men at one time. I said at one time, 800 men. I want you to know the Bible does not describe his physique. The Bible does not describe how big or how small he was. But you know what the Bible tells me? The Bible tells me that the anointing of God was all over him and that that feat was done because God was with him. You say, oh, that's the Old Testament, Pastor. Well, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Then in verse 18, we have another fella that killed 300 men all by himself. 300 men all by himself in a day. Man, he went to work, didn't he? Then there's a guy that I can pronounce his name by the name of Benaiah. And it says that Benaiah killed to, in verse 20, lion-like. These men were so big. And, and don't you find it interesting that God describes the enemies of Benaiah while he doesn't take the time to describe Benaiah? I kind of believe that so that we would understand that if you were this little puny guy, God could do the same thing through you that he did through Benaiah because it's all about God. You see, these guys were hanging out with King David. They are hanging out with King David. And what did King David do as a teenager? He killed a giant with a stone and a slingshot because he dared to believe God. David dared to believe God that this giant that was cursing profanities at the nation of Israel Nobody else would go out. No, not even five guys would go out together. Not even 10 guys would go. Not even 20 soldiers would go out to meet this giant together. There was no band of brothers in that crowd. Come on. But you know what? A teenager shows up bringing lunch to his big brothers, and he could not believe what he saw. His spirit was grieved. The spirit of God within him was grieved to the point that he says, I'm going out to this uncircumcised Philistine and I'm going to slay him for the kingdom of God. And he did just exactly what he proclaimed because he was going in God. <clears throat> you and I can't go in ourselves. I'm not here today in myself. I'm here believing God. Amen. Hallelujah. And so Benaiah, two, two Moab men that were as big as lions, he slayed them by himself. He comes upon this huge Egyptian, and all Benaiah has is a staff, and this Egyptian has a huge spear, huge spear. And what does Benaiah do? With the anointing of God, he goes and snatches that spear out of that Egyptian's hands and slays him with his own spear. God tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that he will empower us through his word. If we will commit his word, if we will get into his word, he will fill us with his word and the sword of his word will do a work for us. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Paul was in jail. The apostle Paul was in jail. And I'm getting near the finish. Apostle Paul was in jail. And the church was praying. And I mean the church was going at it. They was having prayer meetings. They were so focused and plugged in that they barely heard the knock at the door. And here God's already working on the scene where Paul's at. Paul's there, an angel of the Lord shows up, guides him right past the guards. There in the cell with him. He was guarded by guys right in the cell. There were guards outside the door of his cell. There were guards outside the gate to the jail. The angel of the Lord guided him right past all of that. Nobody laid a finger of him. Nobody even seen him. 
Paul shows up at the door where they're having prayer meeting and knocks on the door. One of the teenagers in the prayer meeting hears it and comes to the door, opens the little flap. She can't believe it. She doesn't unlock the door. She runs back and tells everybody, leaves him standing out there at the door, runs and tells everybody else, you're not going to believe who's at the door. We ain't got time for that now. We're praying for Paul. We ain't got time for foolishness, girl. We're praying for Paul. No, 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 you got to understand, you're not going to believe who's standing out at the door. Finally, she gets through to him. They go open the door, and it's Paul. I'm telling you, if they lock you up, God can get you out. If you're supposed to be out, he'll get you out. Amen? When we choose to put on God's given armor that it talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, 12 through 20, when we put on God's given armor and the clothes of righteousness, we have the ability to go sell, spell, invisible and powerful. Amen? Paul was invisible to the guards that day, that night. Power of God was with him. Same God today. Not Old Testament, that's New Testament. Amen? The same God that raised up Jairus' daughter is the God I serve today. I watched a movie based on true facts, on true story. Showed the real family, not the actors at the end. Miracles from Heaven, the new movie that came out. It's worth watching. Had me in tears. The mom had lost her faith because she was about to lose her daughter. They drove all the way to Boston, and God had a purpose for that. She didn't have a doctor's appointment, couldn't get a doctor's appointment. But even though she was struggling, wasn't going to church anymore, fed up with the church ladies because they were judging her, and her little girl said there must be sin in the little girl's life. Because she wasn't healed yet. I don't want to tell you too much, but I, I, I'll say this. God touched a life in Boston, a man that lost his daughter. Now, her daughter wound up having a miracle and being saved, uh, uh, healed completely after she fell on her head 30 feet. It didn't kill her. No brain damage, but she's healed now of this stomach disease. I probably told you too much. Ruined the movie for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Preachers do that. <laughs> That's a true story that happened in our lifetime. God's still working miracles. That mommy and daddy refused to stop believing. Yes. The mommy struggled. The mother was just about ready to give up. But something just kept her going. And God not only healed their daughter, but God brought another soul into the kingdom of God that was a professed agnostic, made a believer out of it. God can do anything. And God's not just worried about you. God's worried about everybody else around you. That neighbor that's given you a fit, you watch. God could use you to help them get saved. If you ain't careful, they may be more on fire for God than you are. Army of believers. Unified army of believers. Here's the key. There are scriptures in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Philippians 2, 1 through 4, and, and, and 2 Timothy 2, 14, 23 through 4. 25, and here's the key. God wants us unified, not debating, the, the, the divided, and, and, and done with each other. God wants us unified. Sometimes we just have to choose to stop talking about the things that we disagree on. 
one of my best friends, preacher in, in Ocala, Florida, he and I talk about everything else, but we don't talk about it, uh, 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 the rapture because we don't agree. We don't need to discuss what we don't agree on because he and I are unified in Christ. So we don't mess with the stuff that we would probably argue about. Amen? We choose to disagree and move on in Christ. We, the body of Christ, you see, we have a choice to be an example. We have a choice to be a catalyst. We have a choice to be a buffer. We have a choice to make a difference. We choose to love people that disagree with us. And if the body of Christ would unite, would unite, would unite, we would be standing in the word of God where it says, where any two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be. And I want you to know God doesn't just want to show up. God wants to be in control. God wants to come in powerful. God wants to come in like an F-14. If you've ever seen one of those land. Come on. If you ever seen one of those do what they do with their arm, uh, hardware, amen? Missiles and 50 caliber bullets and guns going. I can do that and more. But he's looking for a unified body. He wants us to stop squabbling, stop arguing, stop complaining, stop murmuring, and trust him, trust him, trust him. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. God's looking for warriors. And you're not too old to be a warrior. You're not too young to be a warrior. And God does not care what your economic status is. God wants you to be his warrior. Amen. God wants to use you for his glory. I'm in closing Psalms 37. Verses 1 through 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen. God, de God desires our submission more than our solutions. So many times we want to help God fix it. We feel like God needs our help fixing it. Amen. He doesn't. God knows how to get our attention if he wants us to do something. And the one thing God wants us to do most often is the thing that we struggle in doing the most often. And that's praying. And thank him. And praise him. Pray, then praise. Pray, then praise and thank. Be thankful. Amen? Hallelujah. God wants our submission to his process, his working in our circumstance. This morning, would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is here to do a work this morning. If God's speaking to you, I don't know what he will be speaking to you about because I don't know what's going on in your life. I, I know this, that, that, that a lot of great things are spoken of this church. Powerful things, positive things. I know God's doing a work here. So I didn't come in with any assumptions come in with any ideas about who's doing what, who's not doing what. 
But if God's speaking to you this morning, I wonder if you'd just come down and we could have a closing prayer with God. Maybe there's something you want to give to God. Maybe there's something you want to turn over to God. Maybe there's, you know what? God is so merciful and so gracious. I don't care how low you are this morning. God's ready to receive you. God's ready to receive you. If you'll come by faith, Satan will try to cheat you out of receiving what God has for you. But if you'll come, God will minister to you in a very... God's not ruled by his emotions, but can I tell you, God will weep for you. He loves you that much. He'll weep for you. He's crying out for you this morning. If you're hurting, if you're hurting this morning, God's crying out for you. Maybe you have a loss in your life and you're struggling with it. Can I tell you something? God's your answer. He'll comfort you. He'll meet your need. He'll meet you right where you're at this morning. 